Welcome to Sunday School Online. My name is Cassie Waits, and I'm so glad that you're part of our class today. There is a virus in our world today. It is racing across continents. It's infecting people far and wide, and it is not called COVID-19. This virus, unfortunately, is not just found in public spaces. It's found in our homes. It infiltrates our hearts. Fear is and can be a virus. It can spread like wildfire. It can overwhelm us and consume us. And so we see this second virus, fear, causing all sorts of havoc in our world. It is because of this second virus that we have a 34% increase in demand for anti-anxiety medication. It is this second virus that has pushed our toilet paper producers to a 60% higher revenue for the same period last year. It is this second virus that has inspired a record-breaking nearly 2 million firearms sold in the U.S. in the month of March. We begin today a five-part series called Lions, Giants, and Bears, Trusting God in Times of Fear. During this series, we will take a look at what Scripture says about fear and what reassurances Scripture offers us. In week one, we will look at physical fear. In week two, we will look at a fear of a lack of resources. Week three, we will turn to relational fears. In week four, we will look at uh, fears around insignificance and the meaninglessness of life. And in week five, we will cover the fear of the unknown. Before we dive into this series, I just wanted to acknowledge two things. One, the topic of fear is a difficult one. And as we reflect on our fears through this series, we may be dredging up painful, difficult memories, even traumatic memories. And I want to acknowledge that that may happen. And I want to say that it is understandable if this is not the series for you or if you need to take a break um, during some of the weeks. Secondly, I also want to say that while we will walk away with a theological understanding of what, how Scripture deals with fear and the reassurances that Scripture offers for fear, nothing we do is, is in any way um, a substitute for proper medication and sound therapy. And so I just want to acknowledge that there's some that we can do on this, but we cannot address everything. That is the, the challenge, the virus, uh, as we call it, of fear in our world. But we can do something. And I do believe that as Christians, we are called to live lives that are abundant and that our lives lived with freedom from fear. And that is what I am focusing on for this series. One last caveat. The lighting in part of this video is not ideal, and I am sorry for that. I am learning how to both be a pastor and produce movies these days. So thank you very much for bearing with me. As we begin our time together, please join me in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for this day and for this chance to gather, study your word, and apply it in our lives. We pray that you will open our hearts to your teaching and that you will fill us with your spirit of love and power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This week we are studying physical fear. We're looking at fears around harm or injury to the body. And this also includes fear of illness or sickness. Now, when I look back on my own life at the times that I felt or what was in physical danger, I feel fortunate that those times are few and far between. 
But what I do know is those were very, very intense moments, moments that I won't ever forget. Let's pause and let me throw that question out to you all. When have you felt in physical danger? When I think about scripture and what scripture has to say about physical danger, the story that looms in my mind around physical danger and the fear of physical danger is the story of David and Goliath that we find in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now, you probably remember this story, if not from your childhood, definitely from your adulthood, because it pops up every few years. We, we seem to study it. it, comes through the lectionary, and we preach on it every few years. The story of David Goliath, we, we know, goes something like this. The Philistines and the Israelites are having a, a skirmish over their, I guess, over their border, and so they line up on two sides of this valley, and the Philistines send out their giant, a warrior called Goliath. And we have to note here that this was an advance in uh, military uh, ethics, really, and warfare ethics at the time. Instead of having both armies just fight until they killed one another completely and decimated each other, the way armies decided a better way to fight was to just everybody send out their biggest guy and let the big guys fight, whoever wins, wins the battle. It was more efficient and it, it resulted in less loss of life. And so the Philistines have sent out Goliath. He's the biggest guy they have. And Goliath stands out there and he taunts the Israelites and says, won't you send somebody out to fight me? Which is what the Israelites should, should have done. Now, there is within the Israelite army one guy that's really, really tall. He, they have their own giant. And we know they have their own giant because a few chapters before, they chose Saul to be their king. And when we read about the description of what Saul looks like, the Bible is usually very sparse on adjectives, but it does not spare adjectives to tell us that Saul is tall and he is handsome. And specifically, he is head and shoulders taller than all the other people. This is actually listed as if it's a qualification for him to be king. He has to be the tallest guy in the room. So we know that Israel have their own giant. We know the Philistines have put forth Goliath. But King Saul, along with all of the Israelite army, are terrified to go out and fight Goliath. They, they, they're terrified. They can't move. And here comes this shepherd boy, David. David comes along and he offers to fight the giant. Now, before we go further in the story and before we read the, the scripture passage for today, it's time for a little pop quiz. Let's see how much we remember about the qualifications of David to fight Goliath. David's credentials for fighting Goliath were that as a shepherd he had killed A, a lion, B, a wolf, or C, a bear? If you answered A or C, you would be correct. David goes to King Saul. He says, won't anyone fight this giant who's taunting not just us, but our God? David says, I will fight this giant for you. And Saul says, you can't fight this giant. You're a little boy. <laughs> and David says, no, no, as a shepherd, when a lion attacked my sheep, I killed the lion. And when the bear attacked my sheep, I killed the bear. This Philistine will be just like one of them. And that is my paraphrase of verse 34 of 1 Samuel chapter 17. But this is what David says to King Saul. And so King Saul, uh, David eventually prevails on King Saul. And he says, okay, I will let you fight this giant. Hold on a second. Let me give you my armor because David has no armor. And so David, you can imagine, puts on the king's armor and it doesn't fit. He can't even move in it. He can't even walk in it. And so he then hands back the armor and says, essentially, I'm going to have to do it my way because I can't, I can't use your sources of protection. I have my own source of protection and that protection is God. And so David goes out and he fights Goliath. And that brings us to our scripture passage for this morning. Let's read together. 1 Samuel 17, 41 to 49. 
The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. One of the reasons that David and Goliath is such a powerful story is that we can apply it in so many different ways. We see in this story the image of Israel itself struggling against all the superpowers that surround it, all of the, the nations around Israel that have better technology, that have better, um, better weaponry for their military. And here is Israel, and yet... Israel believes that their God is with them. And because their God is with them, there is, there is no giant too great that they cannot and will not prevail against it. And as we read the story, both as children and as adults, it's really, it's really uh, common for us to put ourselves in the shoes of David, to imagine ourselves as David. He is the hero of the story. He's the underdog that succeeds against the giant. He is the one person who has faith in the place of fear, who shows the, the grit and the determination and, and perhaps the courage to go out and face this giant when no one else will. And so it's not a surprise that we want to put ourselves in the shoes of the hero of the story. Now, if we do put ourselves in the place of David as we read this story, and we imagine that fear of physical harm in the person of Goliath, we might well ask the question, what is it that David does? How does he find the courage to go out on the battlefield against Goliath? Take a look at your story again. What actions does David take that give him the courage to face Goliath? I wonder what all you came up with. I feel that if we met together, we would all have slightly different lists. So I'm going to narrow my observations to two big actions I see David taking in this passage. One, I see David remembering who he is. And two, I see David remembering whose he is. I see these two kinds of memory in the speeches that David makes in this passage. So first he goes to King Saul and says, I'll fight the giant. King Saul says, you can't fight him. David says, no, let me tell you my resume. And so he says, I have fought lion. I have fought bear. This Philistine will be just like them. And in doing this, David, in saying this, David is remembering the other times of his life when he was in physical danger. And he's remembering how he came through those times, how he was delivered through those times by God. That's the first big thing I see David doing. The second thing I see David doing, remembering whose he is, happens on the battlefield. He goes on the battlefield and he, he engages Goliath and he has this fantastic speech about how the Lord will deliver you know, deliver them through this battle and that he and that he, Goliath and everyone will know there is a God in Israel and you just kind of want to stand up and cheer at the end of that speech. But that is a speech where David is remembering whose he is and he's saying it out loud. He's remembering that the God that he trusts isn't a God who is intimidated 
by anything that Goliath can threaten. And so it's between those two memories, who we are and whose we are. Um, I think those are the two things David does that give him courage. Those are two things that we can do when we need courage as we face physical fears. Let's take a minute and reflect a little more deeply on these ideas. If you have a pen and paper, I'd invite you to take those out. Take your paper, draw a line down the middle, and on one side you can write, who am I? And on the other side write, whose am I? And then think back on your life. Think back to your experiences. And on the left side, under who am I, write out some of the times that you have experienced physical danger or fear and those times that you have overcome it, been delivered through it. And on the right side, also looking back on your life, remember the ways that God has been faithful, has offered protection, has provided for you. many ways that we might prepare ourselves spiritually to face physical fear. But all of us at some point will find ourselves out of courage, totally out of courage, stuck on the sidelines with the Israelite army, too terrified to even step on the battlefield. And it doesn't matter how strong your faith is or how much you pray. This is simply part of what it means to be human and to be limited. There are fears that will overwhelm us. And I think this is why it can be dangerous if when we read the story of David and Goliath, we only put ourselves in the place of David in the story. A helpful interpretation of this passage comes from Louis Giglio. He wrote a book named Goliath Must Fall, and he wrote it after he went through a time of um, intense uh, personal uh, breakdown. And after coming, coming through that period, he, he said he had new eyes on this story. Not that he was David, the, the hero fighting against the giant, but then more often, he and, and we are the Israelite army, sitting on the sidelines, too afraid to move, paralyzed. And he said when he reads the story now, he thinks of David as Jesus. And he remembers that when it comes to fighting against our uh, fears, against the giants that threaten us, that overwhelm us, it isn't us that are even able to overcome those things. It's Jesus that is able to overcome it. And it's our trust in Jesus that delivers us through, not what we are able to do on our own steam. And so I found that interpretation also to be very helpful as we think about facing fear of all kinds, might we remember that we are not the ones with all the tools to fight against these overwhelming powers, but the one that we trust in, the God that we worship, is. Thanks be to God. Thank you.